as has been mentioned, I've been in Britain a long time. I've been here now 35 years. And it's interesting, I think this whole thing about American education has become a bit of a phenomenon. I mean, when I first came here, if I walked out onto the street and said, can you name an American university, we might not get beyond Harvard or Princeton or Yale. So it's very much a, a ripple in a gentle pond. I think it's become more like quite, maybe not quite the tsunami, but it has certainly become a very, very popular thing for British students to give thought to. Currently, there are about 11,000 students, British students, studying in the US. So lots and lots of people are giving thought to the US. I think one of the reasons that people are thinking about the US is, well, actually, I think there are more than one. I think that there is, and I mean, I'm a British taxpayer, so I'm not condemning the system, but I think that there is growing dissatisfaction with the British university system. Uh, it's, they're, they're changing the system, they're talking about uh, upping the cost, depending upon the next government, uh, maybe lowering the cost. I think there is a more global outlook that people are looking further afield to education. Um, again, cost is, is a big factor. And I think that the notion of breadth is something that is very attractive to a lot of families. Clearly, one of the things that happens in the British educational system, my son went to British University. He wanted to study one subject from the day he walked in to the day he walked out. That's what he did. Happily, he's got a job, so I'm OK. But it's a very different system. So if you're looking for academic breadth, which is what American universities are all about, then I think this is probably why, again, why students are thinking about the United States. They may indeed want to study biology from the day they walk into university, but you know they also want to study art history. They also want to study, I don't know, film studies, whatever. You can do that in the American system. Very difficult to do that in the British system. The American approach to the admission process, and William's gonna spend a lot more time about this than I, is essentially a fairly holistic one. It's a word that's bantied about. But having uh, worked with students who are looking to go into British universities, in the main, British universities are concerned with one thing, how have you done at school? Tell me about your A-levels, your pre-U, your IB, whatever. That, I think, is what they're looking for. The Americans take a much more holistic approach. Yes, they're looking at your school grades. They want to know how you've done in a formal educational setting over a prolonged period of time. That's one of the things, and my heavens, that's an important thing. But then they are going to look at what we would call pre-entry tests. William is most assuredly going to talk about these. There are two different tests, one called the SAT, one called the ACT. I think the goal of these tests, to a degree, is to provide some neutral information. So the SAT that you take in London is the same SAT you take in Los Angeles. So I think it's designed to provide some neutral information about you, confirming, if you will, that you are that A-grade student that uh, your records indicate. They're going to look at things like letters of reference. The, the American letters of reference are different than the British reference, which is essentially a composite reference, sort of a one-page reference. Every teacher putting in a few remarks. So Put, person puts that together, okay, that goes off uh, to, to UCAS and then to the universities. The American letters of reference are different. They're essentially one page in length. Normally, you're going to need three human beings at your school to help support the application. The fourth thing that US universities are very big on, and this always seems the most frivolous uh, to talk about, is they're very big in the whole area of extracurricular activities. Some of it relates to the fact that they think that it's good that you're doing things. I think they're right, it's healthy and all that. But they also look at the interface between extracurricular activities and A grades or grades. And if those are A grades and you're captain of the football team, you're involved in music, you're involved in the school newspaper, again, that is the linkage, that's the interface that has a lot of appeal. So I sometimes say, and I'm not sure everybody agrees with this, but I, I, I sort of believe this, that if it comes down to a deal maker, deal breaker, everybody has A star grades, everybody has great SATs and great references, I think it can come down to a, an analysis of your extracurricular activities. So extracurriculars are big in the US. I know in the, in the British system, when my son applied to university, they said take all that stuff out about being on the football team and the rugby team, so it didn't get included. It's just about academics. And then the fifth thing that American universities are gonna look at uh, our application for admission essays. There is no interview in the United States, generally speaking. 
uh, to, so, to learn more about you, what's shaping your life, what's important to you, why you want to study a given subject, all of the university is going to ask for application for admission essays. They're not long, they're about maybe between 500 and 650 words. Uh, but as you can apply to more than one university, you can apply to five, you can apply to 10. My record is 33, please don't do that, you'll make a lot of unhappy people. There's a lot of writing that goes into the American process. So the, the essays is an absolutely important part of the whole admission process. Okay, so um, as John mentioned, uh, there's two central admissions tests, the SAT or the ACT. They're both administered seven times a year, not on the same dates. Um, they're scored differently, SATs out of 1600, ACTs out of 36. I'm gonna move through some of this stuff relatively quickly because you can utilize our best friend Google for some of these so that I can talk about some of the more granular issues that are not as easy to research on your own. Um, people are always asking me which test should I take. There are some principal differences. The SAT has a non-calculator math section. Some students are terrified of doing math without a calculator if that's you. SAT may not be fabulous for you. Uh, they both have an optional essay. We ask our students to take it. It's becoming de-emphasized in the application process. Um, many schools aren't looking at the essay as closely or at all, but we still ask that you take it because some do. Um, the ACT has a science section, but it's not really science. Uh, there's one to three science questions usually per section, and they're really straightforward. Photosynthesis, which one of these is a gas giant? You know, I mean, this is not super advanced science knowledge. It's mostly analysis of data from chart reading and things like that. And also the, uh, you know, perspectives of two scientists extrapolate from what they said and make some conclusions, things like that. SAT is generally, our students find, is a little less time intensive. So get, you get kind of nervous by the time element. The SAT may be a better choice. But I always say at the end of the day, each of them is just under four hours. Take a practice test on your own. Do not do them on the same day. You will get burned out. Follow the directions. Stop when it says stop. Take the break. Go back, do the rest. Get your scores. Do a concordance as best you can. And if you have a professional to help you, that's great because they'll do more than a concordance. They'll also look at the kinds of questions that you're getting right and the credited responses that you're missing and figure out which test is better for you. The only other consideration that sometimes gets into this is that subject tests are usually a recommended part of a lot of competitive admissions programs. Those are SAT subject tests. SAT subject tests and the SAT one are administered on the same test dates. If you're going to do both, you have to be really organized about how you calendar them because you will run out of test dates if you're not really organized. So sometimes when people start later in the process, we push them right into the ACT because we just don't have as many test dates to work with. Um, personal statement, really important part of the process. As John mentioned, uh, the personal statement is so different for us than the kinds of writing samples that you're familiar with. Most personal statements, and there are a variety of ways to write it, but most personal statements are really telling a personal, yeah, a personal story. Um, there are a lot of different ways to write it, but in general, if I'm looking at a statement, I'm looking at something that shows a kind of journey or a kind of thought process of that particular student. I love a personal statement that shares a secret, that makes me feel like I'm getting insight into that student that maybe even people close to that student don't know. I love a personal statement that engages senses, all five senses, so I'm really feeling that narrative build in a very visceral way. I'll give you a super brief example of a student I worked with years ago. She was very interested in math, or maths for you, and she was super interested in art. I was having trouble figuring out how she should position herself. We did several rounds of interviews. I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then finally I said, yeah, what are you up to this weekend? She said, oh, I'm flying to Michigan. Said, what are you doing in Michigan? That's a long way from New York. She said, I'm going to this amusement park to ride this new roller coaster. I thought, well, that's a strange thing to be doing. You know, is that something you like? She said, yes. I've ridden roller coasters in almost every major amusement park in the United States. Really? What an interesting little hobby. You can guess her personal statement became about that. The start of the personal statement was her at the bottom of the roller coaster in the car right as it began to ascend. And we get the senses engaged as she hears the clanking of the wheels and she feels the temperature drop. She feels the visceral response of her heart rate, right? She starts to get clammy. She's really excited. She looks out over the amusement park and it's a painting by Surratt, right? All color and light through the haze. 
She's thinking about the physics of it. She's thinking about the G-forces. She gets right to the top, and as the cart starts to go over and move down, her hair lifts up, her hands lift into her hair, and that's the end of the statement. It's a beautiful statement because it shows the kinds of topics that she's really interested in. It shows math and it shows art. It shows a real love of learning and an intellectual curiosity about the world that's going on around her. But it doesn't show it in like, a, I'm really interested in art. And let me tell you about a painting that I saw at the Met last week. It shows it really in action. And then finally, just in terms of attributes, what are American schools looking for? Yes, it's very nebulous. It's hard to say. I would say a curiosity about the world around you. I would say feelings of optimism for what can be accomplished and how you can contribute to the world. Um, I would say persistence and grit. That's a very American thing, right? We've all heard about it. It's grit. Americans love grit. Stay to itness. Um, certainly creativity as in every part of the process, even places like MIT, very collaborative learning style. You have to be really creative there. True intellectualism, a true love of learning, not grade grubbing. Um, really focused interests and leadership, polished, professional, persuasive writing samples that show you know who you are and how you fit into the university where you will attend and what you're going to do in life and how you're going to make a difference even if you don't know what your major is going to be yet, right? And really exercising some leadership both in your extracurriculars, your volunteerism, and in class.